It's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad that I can meet with you and uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share some of the work we do in the lab with, with folks at the university. So I'm gonna continue the introduction just a little further. For those of you who don't know me or perhaps if you do know me and you've forgotten this picture that I've shared a few times, this is um, a picture of me it's the earliest picture of me that I'm aware of. And so you can see um, my family sitting around the table there, a number of my brothers, my uh, older sister sitting there um, off to the left. She's still in a high chair. You might be wondering which one is me. And in fact, that's me right there. So this is when my brain was beginning to develop. This was during gestation. And that's what we're going to be talking about, gestation. So in terms of introduction, that's something old, and I wanted to continue the introduction with something new. So one word that, um, that I hear a lot today is influencer. Um, it's a term that it's probably not my favorite term, you know, to strive to be an influencer. I'm not sure exactly what that means, so not exactly my favorite term. I heard another related term last week on a podcast where an influencer said that uh, she was going to a restaurant and she brought along her experiencer. So that's something else we can strive to be. We can strive to be experiencers. Um, also, you know, not my favorite term. Um, but in some senses, you know, when you can't beat something, maybe you can join it. So I've decided to begin to call myself a neurosciencer. So I'm changing my title. And from now on, I'm going to be called a neurosciencer. I'm trying to create a new field here. So anybody who wants to join me as being a neurosciencer, just let me know afterwards. All right. So let's get into this. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things today. We're going to talk about brain development and specific development of the cerebral cortex. So we're going to cover a couple topics. What is a cerebral cortex? When does it develop? What factors contribute to development of the cerebral cortex? And how this could be related to neural developmental disorders. So we're going to talk about development. I thought it would be instructive to do a quick course in brain development 101. So brain development 101 can be broken down into two steps. Brain cells are made, brain cells mature and connect with one another in the outside world. All right, so those are two crucial steps. Um, that second part, that covers a lot of territory. There's many, many important things that are going on there. It's a slow process. It can take up to 20 plus years to complete. Um, perhaps some of us are still uh, maturing, but lots of important stuff there. Um, however, today we're going to focus on that first step. So when brain cells are being made. So in order for the brain cells to mature and to connect with each other, first they have to be made, those building blocks have to be produced, and they have to be produced in the correct sequence. So we're gonna discuss that a little bit today. So what is the cerebral cortex? For those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, this cartoon right here shows an image of a person and sitting inside the skull is the brain. And you can see here this outer bumpy structure. There's a lot of folds and grooves and bumps. That's the cerebral cortex. So if we look at a cross section of the brain, we can see the cellular areas of the cerebral cortex out here. So there's a layer of cells that's called the cortical gray matter. And that part of the cerebral cortex is what we're going to be focusing on today. So there's lots of cells in there they are highly interactive. And these cells connect, these cortical cells, they connect with other cortical areas. So for example, you could have a cortical cell lying right here where the laser pointer is, and it can extend a process that will cross to the other hemisphere and connect with cortical cells on the other side. That's one way that the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere communicate with each other through these interconnections. So the cortex is connected with other cortical areas. It's also connected with deep structures. For example, the basal nuclei or basal ganglia. We can see those deep within the brain. It's connected with the cerebellum. That's a huge processing plant that sits off on the back, back here where my hand is. Um, it's also connected with the brain stem and the spinal cord, okay? So for example, right now, um, there are cells in my cerebral cortex that are connecting with cells in my spinal cord and instructing my fingers to do this. So this is an example of the connections between the cerebral cortex and other parts of our nervous system. So we have this highly interconnected structure. And what you're looking at here is a picture of, of a real human brain. So this is a cross-section, and it's been stained with a dye called um, nissel stain. 
And Nissel stain is purple and areas where there are lots of cells stain dark purple. So this outer layer of cells, you can see that here, that's lying on that outer folded surface of the brain. These are the folds and grooves, the bumps of the cerebral cortex. And you can see that dense layer of cells. So that's what we're gonna be considering today. So the cortical cells are produced largely during gestation. And what you're looking at here is a video. And this highlights the point that everything we see, everything we hear, everything we touch, everything we feel, in addition, how we move, how we plan, and how we think. The cerebral cortex is involved in all these things. So in short, the cortex plays a crucial role in who we are. And if those cells are made and those connections begin to develop, then you can see as that video shows, we begin to learn how to interact with the world. So when does it develop? I mentioned that it's prenatal development, right? And what you're looking at here is an image of the cerebral, uh, actually of the nervous system, very early in gestation. This is three weeks of gestation. You're looking at a scanning electron micrograph. And one of the first structures that, uh, that's produced is the neural tube. And so I've encircled that in red right here. This is a tiny structure, you know, several thousandths of an inch in diameter. It's really small. And just to kind of put that in perspective, what we've got here is the human brain on the right and that neural tube at three weeks of gestation, that little dot right there, it actually should be smaller. That's the smallest dot Bill Gates will let, us, let me make in PowerPoint. So they're at the same scale. So that teeny little dot there has all the instructions and enough cells needed to make 40 billion cells. So the cerebral cortex in the mature brain has about 40 billion cells. It starts as that teeny little dot and it produces these cells. So in human, that cell production phase lasts at least six months. We don't have the exact timing, um, but it's over six months. The evidence is pretty strong on that, I think. Now, this slide right here is going to summarize 10 years of work, and we're going to do that in a very short time. Um, some of the key concepts of, of uh, cerebral cortex development. And what you're looking at here is an image of the human brain at 11 weeks of gestation. You can see that there's a cavity in the central. This is the lateral ventricle that remains throughout life. And then what I've indicated here in these two bands, there's a green band and a red band. Those are two classes of neural precursor cells. I might call them NPCs throughout the talk. And those NPCs are arranged in two bands that line the lateral ventricle. You have the primary band here in green, and then right on top of that, the secondary band. Those cells make the cortical neurons, cortical glia, and those, after they make them, the newborn cells migrate out as these arrows indicate. Now on the right, I'm showing you an image of an actual brain during development. Now the lateral ventricle is down here at the bottom. And in green, we have the band of the primary precursor cells. And nowadays we can label them with markers that are specific to the cell type. So for example, the primary neural precursor cells, they express a protein in their nucleus that's called PAC6. The secondary cells express a protein that's called TBR2. And that's a very useful tool. It allows us to distinguish between the primary and secondary cells. So what happens? I said, I'm gonna summarize 10 years of work. This is what we know. The primary neural precursor cells, they divide in this structure near the ventricle. It's called the ventricular zone. Not important, the name at this point. They divide and one of the daughter cells moves out and takes up a position in this red band. It begins expressing that TBR2 and it becomes that secondary precursor cell. So the primary precursor cell divides, one of its daughters moves out here and turns red. That's the secondary neural precursor cell. That cell divides in this structure that's called the subventricular zone. And as it divides, in most cases, it produces a pair of neurons and those cells migrate out and will assume a position in the cortical gray. Remember in that picture of the human brain, we had that outer band of, of bumpy tissue. These neurons are gonna take up a position there. They have a, a fairly long migration. At 11 weeks, you can see that it's much shorter and those cells are gonna take up a position as the laser pointer is showing you right here, okay? 
Now, one thing to note is that this, these divisions, this is proliferation. There are tremendous amounts of proliferation. So if you do the simple math, 40 billion cells over 40 weeks, if, if the neurogenesis occurred over nine months, you're looking at between 1,000 and 2,000 cells being generated every second. So 1,000 cells, 1,000 cells, 1,000 cells. And this goes on for months and months. All right, so this is a really intense process. Um, lots of cells being made. Gestation is long in humans, nine months, but there's a lot of cells that need to be made in order for the brain to start doing its job. All right, so you have that very complex process. You can imagine that there are a number of factors that contribute to the production of cells. And we'll talk a little bit about what we know about that. Okay, so um, how those cells are produced. Another, way, another uh, way you could ask that question is what regulates the growth of the brain? So we've got a number of images here. There's our gestation week three brain. Two months later, we have something that's larger. Another month later at gestation week 15, you can see the brain getting bigger. Six weeks later at gestation week 21, it's getting bigger and bigger, right? So the brain is growing, it's getting big. And um, there's a lot of focus in the field of cortical development and understanding what are the mechanisms that promote growth. So there's a tremendous amount of growth that's required in order to produce 40 billion cells and not only produce them, but produce the right types of cells in the right sequence. Um, so as I mentioned, there's a lot of focus on that. What are mechanisms that promote growth? Um, but as you can imagine, there has to be a flip side to that equation. There also have to be mechanisms that restrain growth. So we want growth to occur, but we don't want it to be unrestrained. So your brain has to get big enough, but not too big. And ideally you need a balance between the two. You need promotion and, and restraining of those processes. So in terms of mechanisms that promote growth, a lot of focus on that. Many factors have been identified. Um, in terms of factors that restrain growth, there's, I would say, renewed interest in that. And one of the ideas I'm gonna to posit today is that microglial cells, one of the tasks they may they perform is to act as a break on growth. So what are microglial cells? If you haven't heard of them, they are part of the immune system and in the brain, they are the innate immune cells of the brain. You're looking here at an image from a gestation day 80 rhesus monkey, and labeled in green is the microglial cell. Labeled in red are fibers of neural precursor cells. So you see this one microglial cell, and it's got blue in the center. That indicates that cell is actively dividing. And so work that was done in the lab by a grad student, Chris Cunningham, a while ago, showed that up to 5% of dividing cells in the fetal brain, in the fetal monkey brain, were microglial cells. That came as a surprise to us at that time. Now, in the mature brain, if you look at microglia in the mature brain, in the cerebral cortex specifically, the microglia have an even distribution. So what you're looking at here in panel A is an image from um, rhesus monkey brain. And the green dots, those are microglia. And in panel B, you're looking at a postnatal rat brain, the cortex, and you can see the green dots. Those are the microglial cells. So by the time the brain develops, as you can see in panel C and D, the microglia achieve an even distribution. They tile. Each microglial cell has a territory of about 60 microns. And that's true in most vertebrates when you look at the, at the cerebral cortex but that's not true during development, okay? So one of the models that we use for, for studying brain development is the rhesus monkey. So the rhesus monkey has a gestation of about 165 days. You can break that down into trimesters. And if you look at the genesis of neurons for the cerebral cortex, that occurs largely during the second trimester. And when microglia first appear in the brain, there's very few of them. So this is a gestation day 50 rhesus monkey. And the green dots there, those are microglial cells. You can see that there are a few of them. Um, two weeks later, gestation day 65, there are still few of the microglial cells. By gestation day 80, we start seeing a dense band of them. And these cells are located down in the neural proliferative zones where those neural precursor cells are that we talked about. 
And by gestation day 100, there's even more of them. And you can see that there's quite dense bands in these regions where the neural precursor cells are located. Um, we looked at some fetal human tissue and we see a very similar pattern. So, you know, an obvious question is why do microglia colonize these proliferative zones? So in the adult, they're evenly distributed across the brain. But when we look at the fetal brain, we have these dense collections down near the ventricle where neural precursor cells are. Why, why are they located there? This is something that was noted back in the 90s. And the first idea was that, well, you know, there's not enough of them. They have to divide, they have to make more copies of themselves. We know that neural precursor cells divide down here. The microglia must need to divide there too. So they go there, they divide, they make more copies, and then they disperse and cover the brain. Um, that um, idea actually hadn't been tested. So we looked at it in the rat, and this is work that was done by Anna Krutz in the lab a couple of years ago. She looked at the embryonic rat brain and plotted the location of dividing microglial cells. So this would be the peel surface or the upper surface of the brain. The lateral ventricle would be down here and each green cell represents the location of uh, dividing microglial cell. And what she found is that they divide everywhere. So they, um, the evidence suggests that they don't go to the proliferative zones just to divide because they're happy dividing anywhere. They can divide in the pia, in the cortical plate, intermediate zone where that's a developing white matter tract and in the VZ and SVZ, they divide everywhere. So they're not only dividing in the proliferative zones. And so that asks the question, what are they doing? And one way to address that question is just very straightforward. And so Chris Cunningham, when he was in the lab, he addressed this question using markers for different cell types. So in this image right here, what you're looking at labeled in green are microglial cells with a marker that's specific for the microglia. And then in blue, we have the PAC6 expressing primary precursor cells. And in red, the TBR2 expressing cells. And you can see that they're all intermingled here. So Chris looked at these cells in the proliferative zones and he looked at them up close and what you see if you look at panel A over here on the right where I have the laser pointer, you have a microglial cell in green and you can see that it has a process that reaches out and it's touching the nucleus of one of these TBR2 neural precursor cells. So this is one of those secondary guys in the subventricular zone. And he found you know, untold numbers of microglial cells doing this. Here's another one that's kind of wrapping its arms around the neural precursor cell. There's a go-getter that's going after two at the same time. And then he found examples of microglia that had completely enveloped the precursor cell. And then he found microglia that had smaller and smaller puncta of neural precursor cells or TBR2 positive remnants. So this is all happening in vivo. These are frozen sections of normal monkey brains. So this is what's occurring in the normal fetal monkey brain during development. To look at this better, Chris created some slice cultures to, to try to watch what's happening in live time. So we created slice cultures of embryonic rat brain labeled the microglia and the neural precursor cells. So the neural precursor cells are labeled in red, microglia in green. And what you can see in this short time lapse is that here's a microglial cell. It extends a process out and it contacts that precursor cell. 30 minutes later, that precursor has been totally enveloped. And then by two hours, there's a teeny little puncta, and we, we presume that this is the cell eating the neural precursor cell, phagocytizing it is the correct term. Okay, so rho B, here's another example. Here's a microglial cell. It touches a precursor. 30 minutes later, it's completely enveloped it. It sits back and it says, you know what? This is like eating peanuts. One's not enough. It goes after the second one, and in two hours, it's enveloped too. And this is something that we saw quite often in the rat. We found microglia that had as many as five precursor cells enveloped within them. So they're rapidly consuming these cells. Panel C is just another example. Um, when Chris looked at the data from this, it was 75 to 80% of the cases that once a microglial cell touched a precursor, it was kind of like the kiss of death, it would eat it. So who are you? You're out of here. All right, so these are examples from in vivo. This is not um, uh, an, uh, an in vitro experiment, but these images here are in vivo. And Chris looked at 
the interactions between microglia and precursor cells over time. And what he found is that very early in development, there were a few interactions, you know, so maybe 2% of the TBR2 cells had a microglia interacting with it. By the end of neurogenesis at gestation day 100, it was about a third. And so this provided evidence that the microglia serve as a break on neurogenesis. So they come into the system, they're inter interacting with the neural precursor cells and they're eating them. So this is one way that a system can put the brakes on cell genesis. So I mentioned earlier on, you want your brain to be big, you want it to be big enough, but you don't want it to be too big. And so this appears to be one mechanism that can put the brakes on and say, you know, wait, we're getting some signals here, perhaps it's time to shut this down. That's, that's the evidence. That's what the evidence is telling, telling us. So um, this concept appears to be happening across broad areas of the developing brain. So these are images of developing hippocampus, ganglionic eminence, cerebellum. We see it happening in many, many areas. So then microglia enveloping and phagocytizing neural precursor cells. Um, we also have looked at a wide variety of vertebrates and we see this same thing happening in chick, in rodent, in monkey and human. And this is an example that was made by a postdoc in my lab now, Elisa Penna. And this is an image of a microglial cell phagocytizing it or enveloping a TBR2 cell. So this is the confocal image she took. And then she used the Amaris program to create that 3D reconstruction. And what you can see down here, this is the nucleus, the presumed nucleus of the microglial cell. And it has a process that's enveloping the TBR2 nucleus here. So you can see that there's a very tight fit between the microglial cell and that TBR2 nucleus. And one thing to remember is that a TBR2 cell isn't just a nucleus, but it also has its own cell body and processes. But this microglial cell is just glomming right onto that nucleus. And um, if we were able to watch that over time, we presume that it's going to finish that envelopment and phagocytize the cell as we saw in cell cultures and in numerous examples in the fetal monkey. When we first observed this in the fetal monkey, we thought, well, you know, microglia in the adult brain, what many experiments have shown is one of the jobs they do is if there's a cell that's damaged or dying, they come on and they clean up the debris. They'll, they'll get rid of that dead cell, they'll get rid of the debris and, and phagocytize it and chew it up. So we thought, well, these precursor cells must have something wrong with them. So that was um, pretty straightforward in addressing. We use markers for cells that are dying or apoptotic. And we could find examples. So in this case, labeled here in red, this is an anti cleave caspase three marker. And you can see this is a cell that's undergoing apoptosis. And indeed there's a microglial cell that's swarmed and is like, I'm gonna take care of you. You're in trouble, I'm gonna get rid of you. But when we looked at the um, neural precursor cells that were being interacted with, it was far less than 1% that were apoptotic or had any sign of cell death. So we didn't see a correlation between the anti cleave caspase 3, the tunnel, fluorogeid, pycnosis. Um, we didn't see any obvious signs of damage or cell death. So um, I put an asterisk at the end of the word no there because I think it's still an open question. So using te these techniques, we don't see signs of apoptosis or cell death, but you know, it's possible that there are other ways of looking at it. We just haven't seen them. Using these obvious markers though, it, the uh, precursor cells appear healthy. Um, there are groups who um, look at microglial cells interacting with healthy cells. It's called phagoptosis. So they do see um, phagocytosis of neurons that aren't damaged. So it is, the concept does exist. So um, a quick word about animal models. So um, as a grad student, I worked in ferret models and here at Davis, I've had the fortune to work um, with collaborators in rhesus monkey. And we've also continued working in rats. So we've done work in rats, a little bit in mice and um, in rhesus monkey. And what you can see is that the animals are quite different in size. Um, in a paper that I published with uh, Veronica a couple of years ago, we just did a quick assay of how much work is being done in different models. So looking at PubMed between 2017 and 2018, I just looked for publications that had, for example, the word mouse or mice in it. And it was 114,000. By contrast, rat was about 31,000. Um, of all the papers published. And if you look at all the papers published during that 12 plus month period, 
it was 90% of the papers involved rat and mouse. Um, the number of papers that mentioned macaque or rhesus monkey was 0.2%. So there's not a lot of work, comparatively speaking, going on in the, in the macaque, at least between 2017 and 2018. So that said, rodents are great models of human brain development and function. So there are many, many good reasons to use the rat and the mouse um, for your studies. And that's, that's why it, it, it's over 90%. There's, there's good reasons for it. But it's important to remember that there are key differences between species. And one thing that's popped up on our radar recently concerns when microglia colonize the brain. <clears throat> so what you're looking at here um, in the middle panel this is a gestation day 100 monkey. So this is towards the end of neurogenesis. And at the same scale on the right is a gestation day 22 rat. So in both cases, these are at the same relative stage of cell genesis. So this is when cortical layer two is, is um, the production for cortical layer two neurons is finishing. And you can see that there's quite a difference in the density of microglial cells. So you can see these green labeled cells here in the rhesus monkey. And in fact, when we did the analysis, what we found is that microglial cell density was on average 10 times higher in the monkey at this stage compared to rat. And in fact, in some areas of the gestation day 100, 100 monkey brain, the microglial cells were so dense, you could not see the beginning or end of one cell. It just looked like a continuous sensation of, of microglial cells. Whereas in the rat, um, at this stage of development, you could always pick out each individual cell. You could see them clear as day. So remember that in the mature brain, they get to the same place. So they achieve very similar densities in the cerebral cortex in the mature brain. But when you look at when they enter the brain, they enter the brain, comparatively speaking, much earlier in the monkey. And that creates some interesting questions that we can address. Um, before I get there, though, I just wanted to mention that we showed images of microglial cells um, interacting with and phagocytizing precursor cells throughout the brain, but this function is not indiscriminate. Um, we have noticed that there are some regional and temporal differences. There, of course, are species differences as well. Um, so I have a collaboration with a group in Argentina. Um, and one thing that we looked at is how microglia colonize the pineal gland. And in contrast to what we saw in the cortex, it was quite different. So what you're seeing here is the pineal gland developing early in the in rat development. And down below is a higher power picture. And in the beginning, it starts very similar to cortex. So what you're looking at here, these are PAC6 positive primary neural precursor cells. They express some of the same proteins. This is a protein called vimentin that's expressed by um, primary precursor cells in the cerebral cortex. And the um, precursor cells in the developing pineal gland exhibit some of the same mitotic behavior. So they also divide at the ventricle, just like they do in the cortex. Um, but despite that, um, it appears to be a no man's land in terms of uh, microglial cells. So we looked at everyday development starting at like E11 or E12, 13, 14, 15, all the way up through um, birth and then in the postnatal animal in early postnatal development. And we found very few examples of microglia that appeared to be interacting with, with precursor cells. And in fact, this is like the best one that we could find. So it's pretty rare in the pineal gland. Um, in contrast, when we look at the adult pineal gland, the microglial cells just go nuts. And so what you're looking at here are high power images of microglial cells that are enveloping and surrounding neural precursor cells, sorry, not neural precursor cells, but PAC6 positive precursor cells in the pineal gland. So if we looked in the adult cerebral cortex, the microglia would not be interacting with cells like this, but in the pineal gland, they are. So the roles are reversed. So early in development, it's kind of like the pineal gland is saying to the microglia, you know, talk to the hand, leave us alone. We have important work to do here. Don't, don't mess around with us. But in the adult pineal gland, they come in and they start exhibiting some of the same features we see in the fetal cerebral cortex. So it's important to note that there are regional differences. All right, so microglial cells. I've been talking about them um, quite a bit. Um, are there subtypes? obvious answer here, right? So what you're looking at um, is a picture of the uh, embryonic rat brain. 
and this is stained with, for microglial cells. And, you know, if I look at this as a neuroanatomist or, you know, I, I've changed my title as a neurosciencer, you can see one thing that jumps right out. There's this lineup right here. So when we, when we first started noticing this, we were just calling it the lineup. Um, it's something that we've seen in just about every vertebrate species we've looked at. It's in the chick, you know, a simple brain, a quote unquote simple brain like the chick and all the way up through um, primate brains. We've called these paraventricular cells. They're found, as I mentioned, in most vertebrates, and perhaps among the interesting things about these periventricular microglia is that they're positioned, they insinuate themselves perfectly between those layers. Remember those red and green layers of primary and secondary precursor cells? These periventricular cells line up right between them. So they insinuate right between the primary and secondary precursor cells. So um, we looked at this, and this is a project that uh, Lisa Penna came into the lab and she finished. And so here, what we're looking at is an image of an individual periventricular microglial cell in an embryonic rat brain. So you can see the cell body right here, and you can see some processes. So let's add a little context. And what you're looking at now is a marker of mitotic neural precursor cells. So each red circle, that's a mitotic neural precursor cell. And if you could imagine this being three-dimensional, you're kind of looking into the screen, you have this sheet of dividing neural precursor cells, and then sitting right up above it, you have the periventricular microglial cell. And you can see that it's got processes that are extending down and touching these precursor cells. And when we first saw this, to me, it kind of looked like a puppeteer and he's controlling his marionettes. So he's got his little strings down here controlling the marionettes. Perhaps another way to look at it is that this uh, periventricular cell is a gardener and it's tending to its garden. And its garden are these precursor cells. One thing I want to point out, though, is that this red label here, these precursor cells, it's only precursor cells that are in the act of dividing. So the cells that are not dividing, they're here, you just don't see them, okay? So we analyzed the interactions between the periventricular cells and the mitotic NPCs. And that's just a drawing here, reconstructing the whole thing. And I guess I should point out that when the periventricular cell contacts precursor cells, it can contact the soma or the peel process. So each one of these dividing cells has a thin process that extends up over here on the right, you can see a couple of them. There's one of those processes right there. So the periventricular microglia will contact either the peel process or the soma. We looked at those interactions, right? And what Elisa found is that about 75% of the microglia are contacting two or more at the same time. So they're in touch with multiple mitotic cells at the same time. And furthermore, what was interesting is that I mentioned they could touch the soma or the process. If they're touching the soma, the cells, you know, in like 85% of the cases, they were in a phase of division called telophase when the cells are splitting apart. So in telophase, each newborn daughter cell has its own packet of DNA and they're stretching apart and they're about to cut the cord and become independent cells. And so if the microglial cell is contacting a soma, it's usually these telophase cells. So that, that's kind of interesting too. Um, question that we need to get back to. Okay, so if we summarize the data that I've shared so far, microglia contact NPCs, right? But the microglial cells aren't alone. What we found over time in studies that Elisa has done here in the lab is that the microglia are intimately connected with developing vasculature. So in panel A in the upper right, what you're looking at is a stain that labels blood vessels. So you're looking at developing vasculature. In the right, you can see the microglial cells. And what she found is that the majority of the microglial cells are either contacting a vessel or just directly opposed to it, right? And when we look at that, um, it's over 80%. And towards the end of development, it's about 90% of the microglial cells are directly opposed to a blood vessel. So they're affiliated with the blood vessels, okay? Um, so we have microglia contacting NPCs. They're also contacting blood vessels. Um, one question that um, Elisa addressed in a paper that we published a little while ago is, 
how and when do the blood vessels enter the cortex in the context of microglial cells and NPCs. And so she did this really nice developmental study. So this is a rat brain at embryonic day 12. In red is the developing vasculature. And so one of the first structures that forms is something called a peel capillary plexus, and it extends thin processes down. And what you'll see is vessels start forming near the ventricle. Okay, that's embryonic day rat in the rat at, uh, at day 12, embryonic day 12. If we follow that to 14, we can see again, so that peel capillary plexus up at the top is really dense. And this plexus down near the ventricle is almost nearing at the uh, completed being formed. So we have this vascular structure that's down near the surface and labeled in white here are the dividing neural precursor cells. Um, the microglia are labeled in green. You can't see them because they're so closely opposed to blood vessels. Like there's one right there. There's another one right there. Um, so we have this vascular structure that develops near the surface. This is um, embryonic day 16. And we can see that plexus near the ventricle, but the vessels are growing and filling the intervening spaces as well. So this plexus down here, it's the paraventricular plexus. It's the first vascular plexus to form in the cortex. After that forms, we have vascular structures filling in the intervening spaces. All right, so here's our lateral ventricle. And now if you could imagine for a second that we place ourselves in that ventricle and we look up at the surface of the ventricle. So it's a sheet of dividing precursor cells. And now we also know that developing vasculature is starting to come in there. So if we look up and peer at the developing vasculature, this is what it looks like. So we have this, these repeating patterns that are formed by adjoining branches of vessels. And it, the adjoining branches, they join together, it's called anastomosis, and they form these circular loops that are about 70 microns in diameter, and the, many of them appear to be pentagons or hexagons. So you have this regular structure that forms at the ventricle first, and then intervening space begins to fill in with vasculature. So we know the brain needs blood. We can't do anything without blood that's carrying nutrients and oxygen. The developing brain is kind of the same. The first plexus that forms is near the ventricle where those dividing cells are, and then fills in intervening spaces. What really caught our attention though, is that when we, you know, we knew blood vessels are there. Um, when we do a lot of studies, one of the first things that we often do is perfuse the brain and to add fixatives so that the brain remains fixed, the tissue doesn't decay, and we can do further studies on it. You know, we knew it was there, but when we looked at it at high power, what Elisa noticed is that not only do we have these vessels, so this is that paraventricular plexus, but emerging from that are just gobs of philopodia. You can see all these fine processes. That's something that we were unaware of. It was really quite shocking. And those philopodia, so this picture right here, this is from rat. The second picture is a picture that Elisa took in um, fetal monkey brain. So over on the right, what you're looking at in red is the vasculature. In green, those are the secondary neural precursor cells, the TBR2 cells. You can see they form a band away from the ventricle in general. And then in blue, you have dividing mitotic cells. So the mitotic primary precursor cells are dividing down here. And you can see blue spots up here in the TBR2 cells. So those TBR2 cells divide there, right? And what we noticed is that the philopodia are present by and large near the ventricle where those primary neural precursor cells divide. And you can see that better at higher power. So same image, just enlarged. And on the right-hand side, you can see all the philopodia emerging from this paraventricular plexus. So you have that, that vessel that forms and runs along the top of the dividing cells and emerging from it are all those philopodia. But if we look um, away from the ventricle, that doesn't appear to be the case. So if we look real hard, you might see a philopodia here and there but there are dividing cells located away from the ventricle. Um, so the philopodia don't emerge where any cell is dividing. They appear to be specific for cells or the region where neural precursor cells are dividing. So that's um, significant. Like if you look at the statistical significance, it's quite high. So lots of philopodia down here at the ventricle, very few philopodia in this region right here where we have secondary neural precursor cells dividing. All right. So Summary, lots of microglia, they contact NPCs, they contact blood vessels, 
the blood vessels are extending philopodia. Um, in some studies that we did, I'm not going to get into that, but our evidence indicates that the philopodia are endothelial in nature. That's not a big surprise, but the philopodia appear to be emerging from endothelial cells. And those are one of the main components of blood vessels. And one question, since we have these philopodia extending out um, from endothelial cells near neural precursor cells, can endothelial cells affect neurogenesis in vivo? So in vitro, we already know that's the case. Um, 15 years ago or more, there was a lab that concentrated endothelial cells, put them in a chamber, and put neural precursor cells next to them. And if the neural precursor cells were in a chamber that contained endothelial cells, they made more neurons. They were more neurogenic. So in vitro, we know that's the answer, that endothelial cells can secrete um, substances that are secretable, and that can have an influence on neurogenesis um, in vitro. So is the same thing going on in vivo in the brain? And the answer perhaps is yes. So this is an image of a blood vessel at higher power. So you can see the blood vessel up here. The ventricular surface is indicated with the dotted line down here, excuse me. So the ventricle would be down here. And we can see at higher power, some of the philopodia coming off the blood vessel. So the average size of these philopodia varies. They can be as long as 40 microns long. Um, that may be dictated by the distance between the vessel and the ventricle. And here's an example of one of the philopodia that reaches the surface of the ventricle. And in, this is a study that we published from rat developing brain. And among the philopodia that reach the surface, we find that some of them have varicosities and terminal swellings. So here's a varicosity that you can see the laser pointer is pointing to. There's another smaller one. And at the end where the philopodia touches the ventricular surface, you can see this terminal swelling. It's quite large. It's up to three microns in diameter. So the philopodia can have terminal swellings at the ventricle. Um, we know from previous studies that have been published that neural precursors express a protein called connexin 43. And connexin 43 forms channels. And if both cells, if cells that are next to each other are um, both producing connexin 43, they can join and form a channel. So it's kind of like a hatch, so like a spacecraft um, joins to the space station, the hatch is open, and the astronauts can climb from one compartment into the other. So cells that are adjacent to each other, if they're both expressing connexin 40, 43, it can form a channel that allows transmission of substances between cells, between neighboring cells. And this is called intercellular signaling. This is important for the function of many structures. So for example, gap junctions are important for the heart. Heart muscle cells are connected through gap junctions so that when one cell fires, they all fire. So they can work in conjunction as a single unit, as opposed to you know, thousands of muscle cells firing at random. So it's intercellular communication that concentrates their, their behavior or coordinates their behavior is what I meant to say. So connexin 43, we know it's expressed by neural precursor cells. And what we find is that it's expressed also in affiliation with endothelial um, philopodia. So the evidence suggests that there's potential for communication between philopodia and neighboring cells. Of further interest, when we looked at these philopodia, we found examples where the philopodia and the terminal swellings were, quote unquote, inside a mitotic precursor cell. So cell division 101, you have a cell that's going to divide. It duplicates the DNA inside. So each daughter cell gets its own complement of DNA. The cell swells inside because now it has two packets of genetic information, two copies of the, of the cell's DNA. So it roughly doubles in size. And I learned about this in biology and as a grad student, and I just kind of imagined the dividing cell like a balloon because it just gets larger and then it divides and you have two cells. Um, but what we see is that there's evidence that these philopodia appear to be inside the cell. And what that means is that the surface of the dividing cell isn't just a round sphere, but it must have channels, grooves, or invaginations that allow the philopodia to insert themselves. So these philopodia, Find, them, find their way into these grooves and channels where they're located right next to the DNA of mitotic precursor cells, right where, you know, right at the heart of the action, okay? 
this is something that really is, has captured our interest and there's ongoing studies in this. Okay, so microglia, step one, they contact MBCs, they contact blood vessels. Blood vessels have these interesting philopodia, interesting to me anyway. They appear to be coming from endothelial cells. The philopodia are contacting NPCs. There's also an affiliation with Connexin 43, this gap junction communicating. Um, one thing that I'm not showing you is that, um, and this is just as important, the NPCs are returning the favor. So they're being touched by microglia, by philopodia, and they're returning the favor. So the dividing precursor cells would be sitting here. They have processes that extend up that I mentioned, the peel processes, those processes contact, and in some cases wrap around the blood vessels. So there's this intermittent three-way communication going on. And what we have um, together, these microglia, the vasculature, the MPCs, they create this really complex environment in the cortical proliferative zone. So MPCs, periventricular microglia, and the vasculature. They're a neuroimmune vascular unit, perhaps. Now, one question we can ask is what happens if something impacts any one of these three elements? So the, these elements are found right down at the ventricle where neural precursor cells are making the, the cortical neurons, the cortical glial cells that we need in order to move our fingers and try to learn how to play the piano. We have all these elements down there. And the question arises, you know, how could this be related? Can it be related to neurodevelopmental disorders? So one way of looking at that uh, question is considering this model of maternal immune activation. So there are many preeminent researchers here at the Mind Institute and across UC Davis who are using this model to understand MIA and how that impacts the developing brain. And in short, you know, if I get an infection, if I get a cold, if I get uh, exposed to a cold virus, my body will fight it off. So the immune system is engaged it produces a number of cytokines that can be both pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. They're gonna course around my body. And if I happen to be pregnant, and I promise I'm not, if I happen to be pregnant, some of those cytokines can cross the placenta, across the blood-brain barrier, and get into fetal compartments indicated here in green, and they can interact with those. So um, there are models of creating this maternal immune activation. You can use actual agents or you can use um, mimickers. One mimicker is lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin, and that's purified from bacteria. If you expose an animal to that, the body reacts as if this is um, a real infection. And this is an example of it. Some of you have may, may have seen this. These are human studies. And in this human study, 12 subjects received uh, LPS or the endotoxin at a minuscule dose, four nanograms per kilogram. And then the fun ensued. And what they saw, the average of these 12 subjects is that within two hours, there was a temperature spike, they got a fever. Um, their respiration per minute went up. So they're breathing more. Inspiration time went down. What that means is they're panting. So the temperature goes up. They start panting. Why are they panting? Because they're becoming hypoxemic. So you can see there's a spike of hypoxemia. And then there's a number of cytokines that are coursing throughout the blood of these human subjects who have been exposed to the endotoxin. Um, I mentioned this because um, I went to grad school across, from, across the street from the NIH in Bethesda, and I volunteered for this very, exp uh, this very experiment. So of these 12 subjects, I was one of them. I got this four nanogram per kilogram dose of the endotoxin. And I can report here that it's about the worst I've ever felt in my life. For about eight hours, you know, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, I got better though. I'm here today talking to you, so. All right, so back to the microglia. We, we can see these in the fetal monkey brain, those green cells, they're part of the immune system. They're the innate immune cell of the brain. Um, can they be engaged by immune system challenges? And I would say the evidence indicates the answer is yes. And one series of experiments that I'm going to show you are studies that I did um, with Dr. Alice Tarantal and Dennis Harding and O'Connor over at the Primate Center. And in these experiments, fetal monkeys were exposed to Zika virus, right? So what you're looking at here in panel A is a fetal monkey brain at 70 days of gestation. 
And labeled in green are the microglial cells. And you can see that there's a few of them. And there's the lineup down there. There's those periventricular microglia. You can see them as always. They're just saying hello, right? And um, this distribution of microglia in the 70-day fetus is um, the same across the lobe. So we have examples of um, occipital lobe, parietal lobe, frontal lobe. So we see the same thing. What happens if the animal is exposed to Zika virus? So here's an animal that was exposed to um, Zika virus through a fetal IP injection. And in only three weeks, you can see that the microglial distribution has been totally impacted. So instead of having this distribution in panel A up at the top, what you see are these very abnormal clusters of microglia. And on the right here, you see images that, um, that Elisa took of the microglia at higher power, um, something that you don't see in the normal developing brain. And in fact, um, when we look at the volume that's taken up by microglia, it's increased almost tenfold. So just three weeks after inoculation, there's a large increase in the volume of microglia. And just by eye, you can see all these microglial cells here that are arranged in these abnormal clusters. All right, another thing that, that um, Elisa noticed is that there's a change in proliferation. So this is, a, again, a control animal at 70 days of gestation. We have two markers here. There's a blood vessel that you can perceive in this thin section. And down at the bottom, at the surface of the ventricle, you have the mitotic precursor cells. And this is what it looks like in the normal brain. They're usually shoulder to shoulder. They're, they're all down there doing their business. They're dividing, producing brain cells, right? Three weeks after Zika exposure, there's a huge change. So highly significant reduction in the number of precursor cells. And you can also see by eye that the pattern of the vasculature has been disturbed as well. So the vasculature has... Um, different location. And in fact, um, I'll show you some more data looking at that um, in a minute. So drastic reduction in the number of neural precursor cells only three weeks. And perhaps not surprisingly is that there's a significant reduction in thickness of the cortex. So the cortical plate is reduced in thickness and it's quite significant. So the control animal thickness, and you can see in the Zika animal, three weeks after that exposure, there's a reduction. The distribution of the neural precursor cells is also disturbed. And so here's a control animal. And in red there is the band of precursor cells. In the Zika animal, the distribution, sorry, the animal that was exposed to Zika, the distribution has changed. The secondary cells are much closer to the ventricle than they would be normally. And we also see ectopic clusters of the normal precursor cells occupying places they wouldn't normally be. And interestingly, Wherever those ectopic clusters of precursor cells, we also have a cluster of microglia. So could be chicken or egg, we don't know. You know, Do the microglia come and cluster on those cells because they're not where they're supposed to be? That's something that needs to be addressed. Another thing that's noticed, and again, this is only after three weeks, the diameter and volume of the blood vessels is um, dramatically increased, so it's double. So, the blood vessels and then the animal exposed to Zika is double the diameter and there's a greater volume. And you can see, again, so you have these larger vessels in the experimental animal and you can see clusters of microglia swarming around it. And those changes, um, those impairments, they persist. So if we look at a cohort of animals three months after inoculation, the large vessels, the increase in the volume of the, of the vasculature is maintained. The increase in the volume of microglial cells is maintained. So um, double the volume or greater of microglial cells three months later, the increased um, diameter and volume of the, of the blood vessels is also maintained three months. So these are persistent effects of that single inoculation. So um, summarizing, I think we're just at about an hour here. So I'm, I need to summarize. Let me move that the structure out of the way. So we have endothelial cells, microglia, and MPCs, and they create a dense and complex environment in the cortical proliferative zones. Okay. And again, just 
bringing up this drawing. So we have this triumvirate, this neuroimmune vascular unit that's right in the heart of where all the action is. Now, we know from publications from other labs that endothelial cells, microglia, MPCs, each of these independently are susceptible to infection depending on the agent in question. And any single component affected, I would propose here, that's affected, for example, through infection, that is potentially going to alter the function of the other components. Um, endothelial cells can be a route for spreading infection. So for example, if there was a maternal infection and if that infectious agent got through to fetal compartments or, um, or if there's just signaling molecules that get through to the endothelial cells, um, they can be impacted. If there's an infection, they could potentially be a route for spreading infection. So they could potentially be an entry point for infectious disease. Um, and it's also worth pointing out that some neural development disorders have been correlated with vascular abnormalities. There's been correlations with neuroinflammation and also altered levels of vascular growth factors, for example, VEGF. Um, these things have been noted by other laboratories. So it creates a picture that these, um, these factors that we're pointing out here are relevant. And finally, um, microglial activation has also been correlated with release of cytokines and with changes in connexin 43. So connexin 43, it's expressed between um, neural precursor cells in the prenatal brain. The function of the, that communication has not been worked out, but it's thought to perhaps coordinate the production of, of um, neurons and glial cells um, still to be determined. But um, activation of microglial cells has been um, shown to associate with changes in connexin 43 system uh, expression. And so impacting one system affects all the others. So that's summary one. Summary two is that there are many questions to be answered. So um, I'm going to finish with um, first a, a picture. And so we're on this road where we kind of have some ideas of where we're heading. We think that there's some interesting things down the road. And um, I'd like to point out that um, this work has been done um, lately. This work has been done by Elisa Pena. You can see her down in the bottom here. She's been working on this nonstop for the past couple of years through the pandemic, been working at it hard. Um, the microglial work was um, started by Chris Cunningham when he was in the lab. He graduated in 2013 and he's um, opened his own lab at the University of Pittsburgh now. Um, Hunter Shepard was also a crucial partner in this and in, in our early work on periventricular microglia and John Magnum um, also helped. And of course, I have to mention my collaborators, Dr. Alice Tarantall, um, Dr. Hardigan O'Connor, and, and Veronica, who I collaborate with on all this work. So I will leave it at that. Um, thank you once again for the opportunity to share some of this work with you, and I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Steve, for an excellent talk. Um, you have a remarkable ability to take a very complicated talk, talk, topic and make it accessible to everyone. So thank you. I mean, before we get to the questions, I want to make one more plug, just in case um, you weren't here for uh, the introduction for our talk, for our podcast, Science Minds, uh, with our uh, first interview with uh, Dr. Noctor. So please check that out. The link is in the chat. So Steve, we have a number of questions and I'll do my best to summarize. Um, the first one that um, I'd like to ask is, you had mentioned that a number of, of investigators here at Davis are interested in how changes in the prenatal immune environment can impact the developing brain. Would you um, expect a sustained low-grade maternal inflammatory event like um, maybe stress or obesity or other factors? Or would you think that maybe it could be more acute, that there is a pronounced inflammatory response like infection that could have a more dramatic impact on human fetal development? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the data we have just speaks to acute infections. So in the rhesus monkey work, and then in some of the rodent work we did, there's just you know single or point infections or exposures, I should say. Um, whether or not chronic stress, you know, for example, um, if you look at um, chronic obesity, how that influences the system, um, 
I think that's an important question that that should be addressed. And I, I can only speculate that there could be an impact, but undoubtedly it, um, it may be different. In terms of like a single infection, one thing that may, you know, one thing that's definitely important is were you exposed previously? The other thing is the timing. So if you haven't been exposed, if it's a naive exposure, when you're exposed is important because if you're looking at how that might impact production of cells, there's a sequence that's going on. So layer six cells during the first couple of weeks, then layer five, each one of those cells has a different job. They're gonna connect with different partners. And if they're impacted, that's gonna potentially have a different impact on how the brain functions. So perhaps what happens is if you're impairing development, if you're slowing it down, you can reach the same number of total cells, but the sequence is gonna be changed. And you know, we talked briefly about how the cells, you know, they're made and then they have to start making connections. And in order to make the right connections, they have to be in the right place at the right time. And so those connections could be different after some impairment depending on when it occurs. So the when and the what are of course important. So this next question is related to that and very timely and I'm sure everyone wants to know what you think um, about studies that might show similar patterns after inoculation with coronavirus. We have all had our, our, most of us have had our vaccine and uh, especially during pregnancy. Can you speculate about the impact of coronavirus on, on the pattern I'm, development. I'm certain there's people looking at that right now as we speak. Um, um, I would imagine though that different viruses will have different impact and a different ability to infect different cell types. So um, I am aware of more literature on the cell types in the fetal brain that can be infected by Zika than coronavirus. Um, so it's gonna depend on, depend on entry. You know, what can they get into? Um, if you're looking at purely the maternal immune reaction and how that impacts, then perhaps whether you're getting one virus or the other may be similar in some respects, if the timing is similar. But in terms of the virus itself getting into fetal compartments, then, then they could be potentially very distinct. It is something I'd be concerned about. And of course, get your vaccine. <laughs> Absolutely get your vaccine. For anybody listening who hasn't, please. So that was also a perfect lead into the next few questions that we have, which are about Zika. Uh, the first being, if, and asking, were you able to detect the Zika particles in the uh, subventricular zone loci where changes were observed, or was it the inflammatory conditions in the absence of those viral particles um, that caused these changes? Yeah, we did look in experiments that we did with Alice, we did look for the virus itself. Um, and we saw some interesting things, but um, we didn't have complete confidence that the marker was working as designed. And so um, I would presume what we're looking at is downstream effects of the infection. And then a few other questions on Zika. The first being about Zika crossing the placenta to directly affect uh, the neonate. And uh, just read the other two that go along with this and then you can answer it together. Um, and that given Zika at different stages in gestation show a window for long-term effects. Um, and then the third part being, does Zika affect microglia in the adult brain in a similar manner? Um. Great question. Um, does Zika affect microglia in the adult brain? I would imagine so. Um, in terms of um, what were some of the earlier questions, um, whether it, what, what was the question about the placenta? About crossing the placenta and directly yeah. affecting the neonate. Right, yeah, so these studies um, that, that we've done and haven't completed are addressing that specifically by looking at point infections at different points. So maternal, placental, fetal to address that question. So I don't have the answer yet um, specifically, but it's something that, that's being addressed in these studies. And the third part of that, if I'm interpreting it correctly, would be about the, the stages of gestation. So the timing and stages um, that might 
um, impact long-term effects. Yeah. Yeah. So I, yeah. So for example, the brain that we looked at that 70 day fetus, um, that that's going to have a big impact. So yes, there will be persistent uh, effects. Um, different, as we kind of mentioned, there are different things going on at different times. So in the fetal rhesus monkey, um, from all the data that's been published, the production of neurons finishes around gestation day 100, but there are still a lot of glial cells that are being produced in the third trimester. And we all know that glial cells are just as important as neurons. Um, we're no longer you know, completely neurocentric in our view of, of the brain function. So um, there are going to undoubtedly be different effects. So if you had uh, an infection in the third trimester, uh, undoubtedly it would have a different impact. So the next question is about uh, the differences between rodents and primates in development. You mm -hmm. had mentioned there were extensive publications utilizing rodent models yeah. to understand the role of microglia in yeah. development and far fewer in primates. Can you expand on the differences in the role of gestational microglia between rodents and primates? And the second part of that being uh, perhaps how each of these models may uniquely contribute to our understanding of human typical and atypical development. Yeah, quick thing, the, so the numbers that I showed for publications, that was just, you know, it wasn't just microglia, it was just everything. So everything on PubMed. So like 90% of everything is in rodent. In terms of what microglia do in rat, like an embryonic rat versus fetal monkey, I, my belief is that they do the same thing, but there's just far fewer of them in the rat because they come into the system after many of these cells have been produced. So they come into the system while neurons are still being produced in, in large degree in the fetal monkey and in the rat, they come in later through some evolutionary quirk perhaps. Ultimately, you end up with the same numbers. Um, and it, but again, I would presume that any individual microglial cell in the monkey or in the rat, they're doing the same thing. There's just a lot more of them over here in the monkey. And thereby they can have a greater impact if something goes kablooey, to use a scientific term. Kablooey, <laughs> I like that. So this question comes from Christine Nordahl. Um, and do, have you followed uh, brain development in any of these models across postnatal development to see what the impact is on things like cortical thickness? Yes, those Correct. brains are in my refrigerator and being sectioned. <laughs> we have the tissue, but um, hands, need more hands. Anybody wants to come help out, please let me know. <laughs> so we don't have an answer yet, Christine, but we are, we are hoping to get there pretty soon. So one more question is, this is a little bit broader question, talking about resilience of the developing brain. And I think this is um, definitely of interest to our members in the community as well. It, it's kind of an overwhelming, um, uh, it's overwhelming to think about you know, a thousand cells per second. And so can you say a little bit more if some of the um, factors that might um, derail development and then the resilience of the fetal brain? Yeah. So um, when I was a grad student, I tried in part to address that question by halting or pausing cell division using a ferret model. And so first we worked out when each of the cortical layers were generated, and then our target layer was layer four. So I just wanted to stop neurogenesis during layer four. And um, what we found in those studies is that neurogenesis resumed afterwards. So there's resilience. You can pause things, but the system wants to do what it wants to do, and it picks back up. And so there was a reduction in the number of layer four cells. They were significantly reduced, but you know, two and three come after that. They're still made. You know, they're just waiting. You can't keep a good man down or a good a good woman down. Okay, they're going to do their job. So there is resilience, um, but you know, anything that's relatively minor or large, like a large insult, can change the trajectory. And you can end up with a system where, you know, ultimately, and I kind of hinted at this before, even if there's an interruption, I think the system is resilient enough that it's going to try to produce about the right number of cells, but the sequence is going to be off a little bit. And so when they get to that part where they start wanting to connect with their neighbors, you know, one of them might be here and, you know, 
in an average typical person, the other neighbor would be there. But you know, if the trajectory is off, this guy is here and this one is just coming into the picture. And so how they connect with each other can be impacted and you could have different connections that are, that are being established and for the better perhaps, you know, for the better or, or for the different. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.